So it's uh, our great pleasure to have Robert Penner from the IHES. And he will talk about how to apply geometry tools to study viruses. And more precisely, the title of his talk is Protein Blackbone Free Energy to Discover Sites of Interest for Antiviral Targets. Please go ahead, Bob. Okay, well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I want to thank uh, IHS and MPIM for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about my, my current work, this recent work. And uh, we started the board. There are four sections to the talk. Um, first of all, we'll discuss chemistry, aspects of chemistry, then math, then physics, and then biology. So this may sound daunting uh, since it's so comprehensive, but uh, please, please don't be dismayed. I'm going to uh, take just the tiniest little bit, tiniest little topic from each of these disciplines in order to present the, uh, this new method, to present it from first principles. So we'll do, the, there'll be sort of four natural uh, uh, pieces to the talk. Uh, I'm going to do something a little weird and start with the references. This is for uh, later. Uh, attribution also, I sort of forget my collaborators. So here are the references. Uh, the first three are survey uh, monographs. Uh, the book on physics, on protein physics by uh, Finkelstein is a masterpiece. Uh, uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. The, the second is a background on viruses, and it's a gentle introduction, not very technical. You don't need to know much biology to read it. The scientific, uh, by Levine, Scientific American Library. Uh, uh, monograph. And the third one, this background on viruses by Phoebe Lostro, is a beautiful book, but it's much more technical and you really need to know some background biology in order to, uh, to pursue it. But it's a great book. I recommend all three of those uh, quite highly. Um, however, the two books on viruses, the two monographs on viruses, treat uh, the topic, actually the main topic of our discussion, uh, viral fusion mechanisms. Um, they sort of give it short shrift. So the fourth reference is a survey paper um, that's excellent and you can pretty much pick up and just start reading on viral fusion mechanisms, uh, which we'll discuss later in the lecture. Um, the next is a, a paper of fat graphs and proteins uh, with a, a group of, of Danes. Um, it really it treats the topology of proteins. And that was, in a sense, the necessary first step uh, to get to understand the geometry of proteins, which is in this SO3 graph connection paper, uh, where you see an army of, of mostly Danes. You'll notice two Andersons and two Nielsens uh, among the co-authors. And this really spanned uh, multiple fields uh, and disciplines at Aarhus University, from nanotechnology to physics to microbiology to molecular biology and so on. Uh, and that is the starting point for our lecture today, this, has some, this uh, paper on geometry of, of protein. Uh, next is a survey that I wrote a few years ago on uh, applications to RNA and protein. In fact, there's a parallel, or anyway, related theory to what we'll discuss today for protein uh, for RNA. And I won't say anything more about that, but uh, there's a survey paper that treats uh, everything that came before. And then the, the final two are my two recent papers in the Journal of Computational Biology. The first on, uh, on backbone free energy and viral glycoproteins, and the second specifically on coronaviruses. So here are the references, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cite them uh, as we go along as necessary. Okay, so as I said, the first topic is chemistry. And when we begin, so we can do this correctly. So uh, let's begin by discussing the, the chemistry. I guess I don't really need that board. Um, let, me, let me explain what is a protein. So a protein is a linear polymer of amino acids. Okay, what's an amino acid and what's a linear polymer? And an amino acid, is, there, there, there are, uh, it's slightly complicated, there are 20 plus 2 plus 1 of them. So there are 20 standard gene encoded, common gene encoded amino acids. And then there are two more uh, that are rather rare, like selenocysteine and pyrolysine, and then yet another one that is a, a variant of one of the first 20 called informal methionine. And let's just pretend there are 20. I mean, well, let's just pretend there are 20 for simplicity. And the 20 are, can be explained 
as follows. Uh, 19 of them, there's still, it's biology and there will still be an outlier. 19 of them have this basic chemical structure and one of them, uh, the protein, has this chemical structure. H is hydrogen, N is nitrogen, uh, O and C are oxygen and carbon. Um, R denotes a residue, one of 19 possible sub-molecules um, that determine the identity of this amino acid. C alpha is the alpha, the first carbon atom uh, in this residue submolecule. So that's the notation on the left, and you see there's this slightly uh, different structure for for proline. Um, so these, so that's what an amino acid is, and we're going to pretend there are there are 20 of them. Uh, they combine to form a linear polymer, in effect, by condensing off the water. So imagine two of them next to each other. Uh, this is called the amine and this is the carboxyl. The OH of the carboxyl can combine with an H of the, here it's called the amine, uh, the, the amine or amine, and condense off the water, and, and what remains is a bond uh, called the peptide bond between the carbon in one amino acid and the nitrogen in the next one. And, and you can imagine, you know, yet another over here is these condense, and a peptide bond forms between this carbon and this nitrogen and in this way these guys combine into a long uh, a long molecule called a peptide or a protein and here is the part of a peptide that is independent of the identities of the residues um, so let's so let me back up a bit and say so the proteins that we should study uh, the proteins that occur in nature are these linear chains, this linear polymer of amino acids. The sequence of residues from the amine side to the carboxyl side uniquely determine the, the protein. And so a protein's identity is given by a word in this 20, 20 plus 2 plus 1, but pretending 20 letter alphabet. And that's called the primary structure of the protein. And as I said, it uniquely determines, uh, uniquely determines the protein. Um, there's a sub uh, structure here. It's kind of this little song, C N C alpha, C N C alpha. Uh, it's called the protein backbone, and it's the alpha carbon, and then the C N involved in the peptide bond, and then the next C alpha, and then the C N involved in the peptide bond, and so on. So this, that's called the protein backbone, and like I say, it's the song C N C alpha, C N C alpha, um, and. Uh, there's another subunit that will be of critical importance to us called the peptide group. And I guess we need to make this in black here. Uh, a peptide group is this subunit. It's called a peptide group. Peptide group. And the amazing thing, the geometrically amazing thing about this is that it's plain. These six atoms lie in a plane, by which uh, I guess I missed a little bit, didn't I? These six atoms lie in a plane, by which I mean the center of their Bohr model lie in a plane. Um, this happens uh, due to quantum chemical effects. Uh, you notice this carbon uh, isn't four valent, as you would expect, rather, it's three valent, so something fishy is going on. And what's going on is there's an sp2, sp, what's called an sp2, sp3 hybridized bar. So this is a higher quantum state, and there's a, there's a, a figure eight shaped uh, uh, electron uh, path uh, perpendicular to this plane that locks the whole thing into place. And this is really kind of an amazing quantum chemical effect, <coughs> excuse me, um, that constrains the geometry in this way. So this is the peptide group, and the amazing thing is that it's planar. <coughs> now it's a critical role for us. Moreover, the angles in the peptide group, are more, peptide group are, are more or less as indicated. They're not quite 120 degrees, but very close, within a few degrees of 120 degrees. So that's the, so a good approximation of the, the geometric structure of this uh, peptide group. So uh, at this point, it's useful to anthropomorphize. So imagine that I'm one of these C alphas. Uh, I'm wearing a hydrogen hat. Uh, it goes in our little song, C, N, C, alpha, C, N, my knuckles. And my arms are sticking out at, at uh, tetrahedral angles, so more or less 109 degrees. 
there, and sticking out of my back is uh, the residue, which ranges from just a little hydrogen pimple for the smallest case of glycine to some great big, you know, hunchback backbone thing uh, for, for, uh, for instance, for arginine or tryptophan to the other amino acids. Um, so uh, there's still a little bit of geometry left. Namely, when we're going to get C and C alpha, C and hydrogen had backbone, there's still these two angles that are called the conformational angles, and they're indicated on the, on the board. The incoming one is called phi, the outgoing one is called psi. So for each residue, there is a torus, an S1 cross S1, of, of potential conformational geometry left. But the backbone and the peptide groups themselves are actually quite rigid. Uh, of course, these residues have other moduli, so it's more interesting and complicated, but the backbone and the peptide groups themselves are actually quite rigid. And, and again, you imagine a bunch of copies of me holding hands, the, these angles between, between them. Okay, so, and I will later on when I need to remind you of the conformational angles, I'll do this. So, <laughs> this way, the ethropomorphism is useful. Okay, so proteins fold into crystals, not crystals in any sense of the mathematical or physical sense of the word, but crystals in the sense that there is a lowest energy state and the nearest competitor is rather far away. So the protein folds into some characteristic shape and the thermal fluctuations that are inevitable are not large enough to bump it into another competing state. And this is necessary in order that the protein uh, have, its, have the correct shape for its biological activity. It's critical for your life, that the, pro, for life, that the protein uh, folds reliably into this crystal. That's the terminology that is folding into a crystal. Okay, there are a number of forces that uh, lead to this uh, structure. Uh, Van der Waals, ionic, uh, sort of hydrophobic, entropic, electrostatic. And I'm gonna pick on one in particular because it'll play the critical role for us going forward, the so-called hydrogen bonds. And here, let me go to the board. Talk about hydrogen, I can back here. Come to hydrogen bonds. So a hydrogen bond forms when an electronegative, oops, which the black here, an electronegative uh, atom like oxygen comes in proximity with another electronegative atom like nitrogen. Um, whoops, I messed up. Another electronegative atom like nitrogen that is covalently bonded to a hydrogen. So you have electronegativity is a, is a notion that. Uh, Pauling introduced is how hungry is the atom for an electron. And both oxygen and nitrogen are rather hungry for electrons. They have reasonably high electronegativity. Uh, not so much carbon. Um, anyway, let me not go further into that. So uh, this nitrogen has this hydrogen covalently bonded. This oxygen wants, to sh wants electrons, and the nitrogen very uh, generously shares the electron cloud of the hydrogen with the oxygen. And they come really, really quite close within, uh, so I'll go kind of bonds this way, within a couple of X, within two, two, two point nine actually X, which would be uh, N and O, you know, hydrogen bonds. So they come quite close together. Uh, the nitrogen, the generous one, is called the, the, the donor of a hydrogen bond, and the oxygen, in this case, the, the receptor, sorry, the acceptor of the hydrogen bond. So that's the notion of a hydrogen bond. They, this will play a critical role for us. And I guess I don't need to go back to the picture of a, of a protein for imagine that one of these COs in one peptide unit uh, traveled then along the backbone far away or not so far away, some distance away, could, could come back in proximity with the NH of another, uh, a, another um, peptide group and a hydrogen bond might form. So we're going to call those backbone hydrogen bonds. This, this could be what I just described, the, the hydrogen bond that occurs between two different peptide groups in a, in a given atom, in a given molecule, I'm going to call a backbone hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond, which is BHB, 
HP for sure. And these will be critical for us going forward. Um, we're almost done with the chemistry. There are just a couple more things I have to say. Uh, so the, the primary structure is the word in this 20 letter alphabet. Uh, the folded crystal structure is called the tertiary structure. Um, namely the actual spatial locations of the constituent atoms of the molecule is called the tertiary structure. And why don't I put it on this board? Uh, the PDB, uh, as I'll use this, is the protein data bank. And this is the repository of all human knowledge of uh, the crystallized proteins, all of the, the tertiary structures, all the known tertiary structures. It's an incredible resource. Uh, there's like 170,000 entries in it by now. Um, and it's, I urge you to check it out. It's, it's very accessible. Okay, so the, the primary structure is the word in the 20 letter alphabet. The tertiary structure is the actual uh, spatial locations of the, of the uh, constituent atoms. What's the secondary structure? The secondary structure is uh, there are certain motifs of backbone hydrogen bonds that are extremely common. And now we indicate them quickly. I don't have so much time to go into it in great detail. But here's a picture of the standard secondary structure motifs. Um, I'm drawing the backbone as if it's a straight line. It's not, remember. The X's uh, indicate the C alphas. And the backbone is the horizontal stuff. Everything else is a hydrogen bond. And this just indicates the notion of this alpha helix. and beta strands, uh, both parallel and anti-parallel, as in the same direction, and anti-parallel. And notice that the beta strands can combine uh, via hydrogen bonds into beta sheets. And this is a good way to saturate, well, I'll talk about the energetics of hydrogen bonds later. Um, this is a good way to saturate the hydrogen bonds in the, in the atom uh, using these secondary structures. So I guess the one other thing that I do need <clears throat> to say is, uh, <coughs> There's something called here. Go back. Well, let me just say, go back. Uh, there's something called sequence alignment. This is the key tool in bioinformatics. It's a way of taking key words in an alphabet and we can insertions and deletions aligning in order to compare. And this is we can do this so with our the word in our four letters for RNA or in twenty plus two plus one for proteins. And this is a crucial tool. Sequence alignment. Okay, end of chemistry, not so bad, right? Mm -hmm. We can move on, move on to the mathematics, but before we do, let me, um, let me sit down, come here and explain what's the, you know, you need light, uh, what's the main takeaway from our discussion of the chemistry? And it is simply that proteins give concatenations of planar peptide groups. Proteins give uh, concatenations, concatenations of planar peptide groups. So uh, Gaetan, this is one of those pauses to refresh. If you have some, some questions that you'd like to Put forward, or we can proceed. Shall I carry on? Yes. Good okay, time. Are you there? Have we lost them? Maybe? Yes. There is okay. no question which had been written so far. Okay, very good. I guess that's good. <laughs> Either good or bad. Uh, let's continue. Yep. Um, okay, on well, the mathematics. Um, here we make another board. Okay, so for the mathematics, let me draw, to, let me begin with where we ended up last time, this peptide group. We have our C, C alpha, C in, C alpha, and this remnant of the carboxyl O, and this remnant of the amine H. So here we have a peptide group. And what I claim, and we'll convince you of, is that a peptide group gives rise to a positively oriented orthonormal three-frame. For 
uh, displacement vector C alpha C gives a vector. The, the vector C O gives another vector in this plane of the peptide group. We can take their cross product in oriented three space to give an orientation to the plane of the peptide group. And in this oriented plane, so what I just said is the chemistry naturally gives rise to an orientation, orientation on the plane of the peptide group. Not only that, sitting inside this oriented, now oriented plane is the displacement vector of the peptide bond itself. So we have a vector in an oriented plane. Well, that's an oriented orthonormal three free, namely three vectors, so that the third one is the cross product of, of the first two. Um, okay, so a peptide group gives a, a positively oriented orthonormal three frame. Uh, so an oriented pair of, sorry, uh, an ordered pair of, of, of positively oriented orthonormal three frames gives a unique rotation of three space. Well, a backbone hydrogen bond, uh, uh, there's the peptide group of the donor and the peptide group of the Acceptor, it's linearly ordered, it's ordered. Uh, so a back backbone hydrogen bond gives rise to a rotation of three spaces, 3D, 3D rotation. In other words, um, an element of the Lie group SO3. So, um, backbone hydrogen bonds give rotations. Now let me just remind you that SO3 is RP3. Um, it's, it has the S3 as its universal cover, um, but maybe more to the point, uh, of course it has its killing form, which is binary variance, so it has a metric, and the associated hard measure, so it's a metric space, it's a weak differential geometric object. Uh, but more, more primitively, we, we know from Euler that a rotation, let me just remind you, that a rotation is given by an axis L of rotation in some amount of line in three space, and some, some amount of rotation about it. A non trivial rotation of three space is determined by an axis and an angle of rotation about it. So let me choose a unit vector, U, in the direction of this line. And so to theta, the rotation amount and the vector u, I'm going to a scale and just take theta times u to get a vector in three space whose length tells the amount of the rotation and whose direction is the direction of the axis of the rotation. Uh, putting all this together, this is for a non trivial rotation, to a trivial rotation, I just assign a zero vector. And in this way, I'm able to identify SO3, I'm just reminding you something very elementary, SO3 or RD3 is therefore uh, described nicely as a ball of radius pi, namely the amount of rotation, uh, three three dimensional ball with antipodal points identified. Minus antipodal identification. Identification. So I say all this because there's something <clears throat> quite natural to do. Let us go to the PDB, namely this database of the proteins that we know, and sample all of the backbone hydrogen bonds there. I'll, I'll modulate that a little bit in a second. Um, and just take a histogram in this bowl that is SO3 and draw a picture. What does the collection uh, of all rotations, the BHB rotations of BHBs coming from, uh, rotations coming from BHBs, what do they look like? Uh, in fact, that's not quite what we're gonna do. And the reason is that the PDB is highly biased. There are popular proteins and unpopular proteins. For example, there's a protein associated with influenza called hemagglutinin, and there are over 200 examples of hemagglutinin. So there are some proteins that are popular and others that are not. There are other issues too. Some proteins are easier or harder to crystallize and, and get the, the, the actual data. Um, but that, that part we can address. But we can address this popularity of proteins. So we do that by, um, there's a, a subset of PDB, we call it HQ60. Uh, this is a subset of the PDB, 
which is meant to be an unbiased subset of all the proteins that are there. HQ stands for high quality, for also some PDB files are, are, are more reliable than others. And well, let's take the reliable ones, the high quality ones. Moreover, remember I mentioned this notion of sequence alignment. Uh, the 60 refers to a 60 percent uh, sequence, less, less than or equal to 60 percent sequence identity in, in this sense. So we're going to find an unbiased subset of PDB uh, by using sequence alignment to, uh, to not oversample the popular guys. We're only going to look at high quality things. And there's some other issues, <clears throat> excuse me, that we, some other aspects that we impose that I, I think I don't want to go into. But this HQ60 is meant to be an unbiased subset of the protein data bank. And what we can do is take the collection of backbone hydrogen bonds that occur in this HQ60, uh, which are 1,166,165 number, so a fairly large collection of, of, of BHBs that we're going to sample and draw a picture in three states, draw a picture in this, in this ball that is SO3. So let me show you that picture. And here it is. So this is uh, a rendering from the North Pole to the South Pole in slices of the density. It's a, it's a heat clock density, red, red uh, yellow, green, blue, um, from North Pole to South Pole. And it's absolutely striking. What's striking about it, two things. One, look at all the white space. Nature, you, you might have expected, I certainly, we in Denmark certainly expected, certainly expected to see just noise. But in fact, there's this huge structure, there's all this white space. Nature is very conservative and uses only part of the geometry available to it. Indeed, only about 33% of the volume of SO3 is, is employed by this HQ60. Not only that, within that 33%, you can see this clustering in sort of these red regions. So within the 33, it's not even, it's not uniformly distributed within the 33% either. In the 33%, there are these, these clusters of, of uh, places that nature uses a lot of backbone hydrogen bonds. Um, in fact, you might wonder where is uh, the alpha helix, and it's right about here. The hottest spot is the alpha helix, which sometimes isn't too surprising. And you might wonder also what the beta strand is and the LB, I forget whether it's parallel, I think it's probably anti parallel, is here the next top spot. It's, it's near, nearby. Um, here's another, I gotta say, this was a, I remember the day when we, there were some bugs in the code, and I remember the day that in Denmark that we finally produced this graphic, and I was running down the hall looking for your yard, you won't believe it. Uh, because it jumps off the page that there's the structure that, that one isn't really expecting, and, and there it is. Um, okay, let me give you another rendering of the same. That really was the first graphic of this whole, this whole deal, circa 2012 or something like that. Here's maybe a more sophisticated version of what one might call a graphical abstract. So here's the ball with a rendering of the density in it, <clears throat> a rather less colorful rendering of the density in it and representative BHBs from various locations within, within SO3. Um, so let me say, uh, the, there was this further structure of the clustering and, and what we did with the Danish group was uh, studied that and managed to uh, reproduce, refine, and, and extend the existing classification of geometries of backbone hydrogen bonds, which there was an existing classification for things that were short range along the backbone. And we, like I said, we, we reproduced and refined that. But not only that, this was the first classification of things that are long range along the backbone. Um, and that's what was worked out in this paper with the, the, the many authors. The clustering will for us play absolutely no role in what comes next. Um, just this kind of, after all, you're presented with a, de with a density and you as a human being are going to figure out some way to cluster. You interfere, you interfere with nature. But if we just take, stand back, nature, there's this God-given density on SO3 and that's the only thing we're going to use in the sequel. Okay, so uh, the clustering will play no role. Um, how are we for time? Uh, yeah. 
let me make a couple remarks, just a couple. Um, and let me, let me be brief. Uh, so you might wonder that this, the white space comes from the fact that you, you so-called steric obstructions, that the, 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 the atoms will bump into each other. It doesn't, we check that. Um, in fact, what happened, there's something called DFT, density functional theory, where you can solve, you can give an approximate solution to the Schrodinger equation for the, the 12 atoms involved in two peptide groups. And we did that, one of them, our, our team, they did that. And, and uh, that roughly reproduced the density, not the fine structure of the clusters, but this suggests that, that there's quantum chemistry. Quantum, quantum chemistry is somehow behind the scenes in, in the reason for this uh, clustering in the first place. Um, I, mean, I, I, I made two more remarks. Uh, three more remarks, I guess. We varied HQ to LQ to lower quality uh, uh, PDB files, and varied the 60 to 30 to 90 and so on to check that the, the basic uh, property of this clustering of the, of the density uh, were robust against the data used to compute it. Indeed, they were. Uh, you might wonder, this is interesting too. So we have these two planes, and there's a rotation that we're studying. But there's also a translation, say, from the C alpha, from the first C alpha to the first C alpha. And so there's a translation as well. And you might wonder, did the translations cluster? Or what's going on with that? Um, and the answer is the rotation essentially determines the translation. So there isn't extra data there. And it's in, that's an interesting statement. That the rotation basically determines the translation. I mean, this was a, a latter day realization of mine. I think my, my collaborators may have realized this sooner than I did. These clusters are very cluster-like. They're highly anisotropic. There's nothing like a, a normal distribution within them. They're, they have kind of swirls, uh, and uh, the local structure is something that I would like to get better understand. Okay, and the mathematics uh, that we shall need. Um, let's go back and continue with our main takeaway business. And it's our main takeaway anyway. Okay. Is that uh, the takeaway is that a backbone, a backbone hydrogen bond determines a rotation, 3D rotation. Uh, so HQ60, this sub, uh, subset of the PDB that is unbiased, uh, determines a density on SO3. And it is this density we shall now proceed to uh, study. Um, maybe it is worth mentioning, or I, well, I, you can look in the papers, uh, the, there's a server uh, in Denmark where you can upload a PDB file and it will compute the free energies, uh, you can then download a file that has the free energies in it, and uh, let me not put the, the URL up, you can find it in, in the papers, but this is freely accessible on the web if you want to do an anal analyze proteins yourself. Okay, so physics. I guess we can just add more. Okay, physics discussion. <coughs> oh, sorry, get time. So we pause the pause and refresh if you have questions. Or maybe no, I don't want to know. Okay. Okay, we proceed. Um, yep. There is a powerful method in protein physics called the Paul Finkelstein quasi Boltzmann ensembles. Paul Finkelstein quasi Boltzmann ensembles. Uh, this was observed by Paul in 1971 and proven by Finkelstein only, Finkelstein and collaborators only in 95, so some 20, almost 25 years later. And it's the following statement, and it's amazing, this is a, it's, what's amazing is its breadth, of, uh, the breadth of this statement. Um, so proteins have various local details, for example, these phi and psi angles, which was where Cole first observed this phenomenon. Uh, are, are the, what we're studying here, these, these rotations, uh, salt bridges that form, um, the angles in the residues, uh, there are various local details of a protein. 
and for any local detail, and this is the amazing, this, let's just, for any local detail of a protein, local detail of protein, so it's the breadth that is so amazing, the occurrence, the occurrence of the detail is proportional to the exponential of the negative of the free energy over uh, the usual Planck constant times an effective temperature called the conformation temperature. So there's a Boltzmann-like law that uh, describes the occurrence, that governs the occurrence of any local detail. F is the free energy, like I said, um, and TC is the compass effective temperature. This is not a Boltzmann law in the usual sense of a, of a, of a, of a, a particle uh, visit, a, a not in equilibrium visiting energy states with a with log, with probabilities of the log, difference of log probabilities of the difference of energies. No, no, because the protein isn't jumping around between the different conformations. It's not visiting these states. Rather, this is a statement about the statistics of which primary structures, which words in this 20-letter alphabet stabilize the detail that you're studying. Um, it's like, it's really the dynamics of flipping a 20-sided <coughs> coin that is, excuse me, that is, that is described by this law. Bob? Yes, sir. There is a question, so okay. I will uh, leave Aurora to talk. Hi, Aurora. Hi, I just had a quick question about sure. the clustering behavior of the BHB induced rotations. Sure. I was I was wondering if people have done follow up studies in terms of uh, correlating the clustering behavior with the hydrogen bond strength and cooperative behavior of the hydrogen bond network. In fact, our paper has gone largely unnoticed. I think there, there are five or something citations. You know, Jorn has three of them and I did two of them. <laughs> no, I don't think there's been any, any follow-up really to speak of. But I, I, I agree there should be. There's much, to, I think there's much disinterest in that. I don't know of any follow-up studies on, on that. Maybe, uh, period. Um, no, sorry, I just don't. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Okay, so the, there's this quasi-Boltzmann ansatz of Paul Finkelstein, and its power, and that's is what we're gonna we're gonna capitalize upon, is that you can go off and do experiments, and and on the basis of the data you observe, estimate the free energy. So that's the point: is that is that empirical data gives you a tool via this uh, Paul Finkelstein. Einstein Hansatz uh, to, to estimate free energy. Let me talk a little bit about free energy and proteins. Um, and I had promised you some, some energetics earlier. Here, here, let me do this. So uh, overall, the protein has to have some negative free energy in order to, to, to retain its configuration. So somehow overall, there has to be uh, somehow negative free energy. In fact, uh, the, the limit of, of positive free energy for uh, protein stability is about eight to nine kilocalories per mole. This is the uh, limit, limit of protein stability. In other words, take a protein and hit it with more than this and it'll just fall apart. Limit of protein stability. Um, so the positive free energy parts of the protein have to be compensated for by other low free energy places in the protein. It's sort of a balancing act. Now, why would the protein permit these high free energy, why would evolution permit these unstable high free energy regions? And the answer is high free energy is, can be useful for protein function. So it's as if the high free energy parts are tolerated by the rest of the protein and preserved by evolution only if they're useful for protein function. And like I said, this is eight to nine kilocalories per mole. I thought I would give you a little bit more uh, energetics. KT, so the thermal fluctuations are about 0 0.6 kilocalories per mole. Uh, a hydrogen bond, H bond, 
is about minus 1.5 kilocalories per mole. So they're not that, this is, sorry, this is in, in, in the aqueous, there's a difference between aqueous and non-aqueous. In the aqueous environment, the hydrogen bond is about, that's not legible, huh? is about minus 1.5 kilocalories per mole. And I wanted to give you one more, oh yeah, this will come up later. Um, an internal turn to an alpha helix, so an internal, internal alpha helix turn, I'll just call it, uh, has a nominal free energy of minus two kilocalories per mole. And I guess you can start to see why uh, proteins use a lot of alpha helices because it gives them a lot of negative free energy in order to compensate, in order to compensate for the high free energy elsewhere they might, they might require. Okay, so I, want, I promised you some energetics and there's that. Now let me explain how we're going to use this fabulous tool of Paul Finkelstein uh, in our city. Um, okay, we're going to uh, construct, construct, we're gonna compute the density from HQ60 that we had these pictures of, and we're gonna describe it as a function D, density, go, uh, a real value function, positive real value function defined on SO3. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna treat this like an applied mathematician. Uh, there, there are maybe more elegant ways to do it, but this is how we did it with the Danish group and how I, I should do it here. Uh, there's this ball of, uh, of radius pi. It inscribes in a cube of edge length two pi in the natural way. I take that cube and I cut it up into 81 by 81 by 81, about half a million smaller little boxes. And now I'm just gonna count in each box how many BHP rotations from HQ60 there are. And then, at least I'm a good, I'm a good applied mathematician, I'm gonna make sure to scale by the SO3 volume of the box. So to do this correctly in the geometry of SO3. Um, so in other words, I construct this piecewise constant, piecewise constant approximation to the, the density we computed this with these 1.17 or less um, uh, backbone, backbone hydrogen bonds. Um, okay, so having constructed D, uh, I'm then going to finally define the normalized free energy pi of a point P in SO3, and it's the logarithm of uh, the density at the alpha helix. Remember I said the alpha helix was the mode of the density. It's the highest, the point of highest density in this, in this uh, distribution, uh, divided by the density at P. So again, P lies in some box, and that gives a density to P, and we take the logarithm. And let me tell you that, in fact, the thing that I pointed at twice, uh, the density alpha is uh, about 19, it's 18, it's so close that it's fair to call it 19,000, 18,999 point, I don't remember the other two digits. Um, so, in other words, this pi of P is the log of 19,000 over dP. Uh, let me tell you a little bit of the statistics of this guy, 7.5 pi equals uh, pi equals 7.5, 8.5, 9.5, and 9.85 uh, are approximately, in fact, quite a good approximation, to the 90th, uh, the 95th, the 99th, and the 100th uh, percentile. percentile. So the log of 19,000 is 9.85. Conclude. So this is sort of the the statistics. I'll, I'll, draw, I'll show you pictures of the, the, the histogram, the density of pi values in a moment. Um, but let me first make a definition that will be key for us. I'm going to say that uh, that a BHB is exotic. Is the term I'm going to use exotic? Uh, if uh, pi of it, uh, BHBP, and I don't mean BHB, I mean the rotation, BHP. Yeah. So uh, 
the what to say the the rotation rotation of of BHP. So I'll refer to BHP as being exotic. It's exotic if uh, BHP P so pi of P uh, is greater than the seven point five, namely it's in the ninetieth in the ninetieth percentile. And now I actually want to extend this notion of exoticness uh, to uh, to residues. So suppose we have in our C alpha and C and C alpha, C and C alpha. In other words, in other words, there's a nearby CO and a nearby NH. And if any of the hydrogen bonds associated with the carbon or any of the hydrogen bonds associated with the nearby nitrogen, if any of those are exotic, then I'll call the corresponding residue exotic. So R residue is exotic. Exotic. If any, we just say nearby, nearby uh, the HP is. Okay, so we have this notion of exotic which will play a key role going, going forward. Um, so I promised you a plot or two. And here is a plot, a histogram of these pi values across HQ. 60 across all of HQ60, so they're bin here in, in uh, size 1.8, and the occurrence is here. So you notice there's much going on here, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, down for low pi values, and then there's this slow hump up around five, and then this tail, which is where we in the exotic range, which is where we'll be keenly interested subsequently. Below that histogram. It are the, the alpha helix and beta strand occurrence uh, across the same energy spectrum. And I apologize, both here and in my paper on this, uh, the x-axis is off by a factor of 10. So this is 0.04, it's really 0.4. So these are aligned. The, the, the top uh, plot is aligned with the, the other two. And you see the, the, the big spike um, for low energy are the alpha helices. For low low uh, free energy, oh, uh, for, sorry, uh, yeah, for low free energy alpha helices. There's something I must say. When you have a backbone hydrogen bond, there are there are uh, two peptide groups, one one on either either side, and hence there are four residues that you could think of. And it's the, it's the flanking, uh, the uh, secondary structure type is an attribute of the residue. So I look at the the secondary structure of the four flanking residues. Is what I'm plotting. The four flanking residues. So, um, all right. So you see, there, the, this big spike up here is uh, alpha helices. Remember that uh, ideal alpha helix, the nominal ideal alpha helix, uh, is the point of highest density. So pi is zero. So that's here. So it's interesting. It's not quite ideal. It's not the maximum. Notice the different scales here, here in, on the three on the three plots. Um, and this sort of slow hump is the appearance of beta strands, that's what we say it's for, uh, that occur starting around 3.6. Um, now, I mentioned before, but there are other types of secondary structures, so called 310 helices and beta bridges, and pi helices and so on, pi helices and so on. And that's the, the bottom plot here. And notice, notice again the different scales it's 15,000, this is 200,000. So and so I couldn't really reasonably plot these on the same on the same graph, and that's the reason they're they're broken up. And what you see is in this exotic tail, uh, everything happens. So down for low free energy, it's alpha helices. Then there's this hump, interestingly positive free energy for beta beta strands. Um, and then when you get out into the tail of free energy, it's anyone's guess, everything happens. Um, okay, so there's another sensible plot to look at. Um, we can hurry for time. Perfect. Um, namely, let's look now not at flanking secondary structure, but flanking primary structure. And I was expecting this, you know, I was going to put this in the supplementary material of the, of the paper. I thought this was going to be just boring, but something absolutely dramatic happens. Um, here's the exotic tail. 
so again, on the x-axis are the pi values, and here are the 20, the, the, the residue types, the amino acids have, have one-letter codes, and here I use the, the one-letter codes, um, the key is on the very top. And this is what happens in the exotic tail. And first of all, this is glycine, the one that I mentioned is just a, has the hydrogen pimple as, as residue. And you notice the prevalence of, of glycine out in this, in this exotic tail. And this is presumably as the, as the free energy goes up, the backbone is becoming more and more convoluted and twisted. And you need these small, this small residue to accommodate the, the, the contortions that, that are being done. But that's not the striking thing about this. The striking thing about this is choose some little window in, of pi values. And what you see is that there are certain fellow travelers. So for instance, here, alanine and valine, the blue and the gray, uh, between 8.6 and 8.7 travel together. So what this strongly suggests is that there are primary structure motifs, small snippets of letters in this, tw in this 20 letter alphabet, small words that, that uh, govern this, the high free energy. And the exciting thing about this is this might be recoverable with machine learning. And hence, uh, there's the potential of, of finding the high free energy sites, and you'll still see in the subsequent sections why we care about that. Um, from the primary structure alone, no PDB file required, and this would vastly extend the method. So here's a machine learning. This is, seems to be screaming to be done to, to uh, apply machine learning to this database to try and understand these fellow travelers, which you see with your eyeball. So. Uh, Okay, so that's it for the physics. And you see it was only sort of physics. It was quasi-physics, I guess you could say. Um, let's go to our main, let's go to our takeaway, takeaway board. And the takeaway board is that EHB, EHB free energy, free energies, free energies can be estimated. Estimated. From our density. And again, here's a suitable time to pause for questions if you want before we move on to the biology. Okay, so let's move on to the biology. All right, well. Okay, well, we mathematicians love our definitions most of all. So let me give Phoebe Mostro's definition of a virus, because now we're going to turn our attention to viruses. So Dr. Mostro says that a virus has four attributes. Uh, first of all, it's an obligate intracellular. I'll come back and talk about the words in a second. So, Parasite, parasite with uh, infectious, infectious extracellular stage, extracellular stage. Um, so obligate just means it's obligated; it can't reproduce, it can't live its life without being an intracellular parasite. In infectious extracellular uh, stage speaks for itself. Uh, second of all, um, it has to have at least one so-called capsomere. Capsomere, and a capsomere is a protein, just like the ones we have been discussing, that uh, forms a so-called capsid, which is a protein uh, lozenge, if you will, that surrounds the genetic material of, of the virus. Uh, the, the genome is, 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 is fairly fragile. Uh, not only that, but out in the, in the world, out extracellularly, the immune system is especially alert to, to genetic material. So this capsomere protects the, the genome in both these senses. Um, and and uh, the capsid protects the, the genome in both these senses. And, and uh, this is after what's for a second. Axiom. 
Uh, the third axiom is that it replicates, replicates by assembly. So you'll see what I mean in a moment. The various means the various pieces of the viral particle are constructed, and we'll discuss that. And then they're put together. They're assembled before the viral particle is, enters its extracellular infectious stage. And finally, and very tellingly, uh, it's subject subject to evolution. So like I say, uh, here's I think actually quite a beautiful definition of, of what is a virus. There are estimated to be over a billion different viruses in our planet, which is astounding, frankly, over a billion different viruses, different viruses. Um, and they have uh, two I mean, uh, okay, we'll come to the life cycle in a minute, but there are two kind of Herculean tasks they must, uh, Herculean tasks that they must pull off. Uh, one of them is, uh, well, this capsule is pretty small, so the genome has to be pretty small to fit inside it. So they have to very cleverly uh, code enough proteins for their function in a small genome. And so they, uh, uh, they need to fit uh, in their small, in their, uh, in, oh my, trouble. Um, do I even know what to do? No, I'm not sure what happened. Should I get Francois? Yes, Francois, we need you, man. Sorry, I, just, I didn't even know what I did. Maybe it's a good time to pause for questions. <laughs> if you push in the go back button, the first one. Sure. Um, no, the, the second one. Something that. All right, there we go. Anyways, thank you. Okay, so we're, we're back. We're back to business. So, so the two should get. Sorry, we got it. Thank you. The two Herculean tasks are, first of all, to. Uh, fit all the protein info, info into a small genome, small genome. But now I'm all nervous about bumping into the board because I don't know what I did, but okay. Um, so first of all, and second of all, throughout their life cycle, there's the big brother watching. The, there's the uh, immune system, uh, both in the cell and out, outside the cell. And so they need to trick Trick, let's say evade, evade uh, the host immune system, both in the cell and out, outside the cell, the immune system. And it is absolutely stunning the, the, the clever, cunning, brilliant solutions to these two problems that, that uh, viruses pull off. There is a collective intelligence to viruses that is absolutely stunning. There's, a, I'm, uh, I'm, I, and, and of course, there's not a neuron to be found. This kind of neuronal intelligence that we human beings appreciate is not what's at play. What's at play is evolution. And I'm reminded of this wonderful quote of Leslie Orgel uh, in a slightly different context where he says, uh, evolution is smarter than you are. And boy, is that evident with the, with the viruses. It's incredible. The, how they solve these and their other problems and with, with brilliance and finesse. I mean, it really is stunning collective intelligence. Okay, enough poetry. Uh, I guess it's art. Uh, let me show you uh, a diagram of the viral life cycle. Um, in fact, I took something off the internet for hepatitis C because it was in the public domain and hep C and, and coronavirus, we're gonna turn our attention to coronavirus presently. They're similar enough that this should suffice. So here's a picture of this viral particle. Um, it's an icosahedral uh, capsid for hep C, not so for, for coronavirus, and that's a different structure. Um, it's what's called, both of them are called enveloped. So outside of the capsid is a lipid, namely a fat uh, membrane. Uh, the, the, the capsid in these cases, for, for coronavirus, the capsid is about 100 nanometers diameter, and then this, this lipid bilayer is three to four nanometers. 
Um, and sticking out of this lipid bilayer are uh, vi what are called viral glycoproteins. Um, there are actually two different uh, glycoproteins for hep C and just one for coronavirus called the spike. And that's what's de depicted, depicted here in the viral particle. The capsid uh, for hep C, acrosahedral, is lipid bilayer and the spike sticking out. I've learned that if I, in a practice for this lecture, I learned that if I start going into detail, it'll be two hours from now because there's so much intricacy and so much to say. So I'm really just going to regard this as a very rough cartoon. And, and in fact, it's not even quite accurate for MC either. Anyway, this viral particle is taken, cells are welcoming. They, they say, come on in, and they're going to eat you for dinner, but but they're, you're brought in in this endo, endocytic uh, particle. Um, and then the virus has to escape this particle, and it does so with this spike. First of all, the spike like a protein mediates the attachment. And second of all, uh, some viruses come in directly through the membrane layer. Uh, hep C and corona come through this endocytic pathway, and they're enclosed in a in a bubble, if you will, a lipid bubble, and they have to bust their way out. So they bust their way out uh, through a so-called fusion, and this is the part that we'll be concentrating on, attachment and fusion in a moment. Um, and so here's a picture with no lipid and no spikes, and then this so-called nucleocapsid or whatever this region has to uncoat in the vernacular, and it uncoats to release its RNA. But in both these cases, it's positive sense RNA, so that it can immediately start being translated into, into protein by the host ribosomes. Uh, notice there are two things that must be translated. First of all, the genome. We need, we need, in order to throw out a bunch of offspring, we need a bunch of copy of the genome, so you have to replicate. Uh, you also have to, you, the virus, also have to produce all the proteins necessary for the capsid and, and many other functions. And so that's the synthesis stage of replicating and producing all the, all the proteins. Then uh, there's an assembly stage where all, it's all put together. And then uh, both Tepsi and coronavirus are believed to exit the cell through uh, kind of the reverse of this endocytic pathway, but with a bunch of so called uh, multivesicular body uh, that carries the, your offspring out and buds out and bang starts over. So then there's a release phase. So those are the basic life, the most basic stages in the life cycle of a virus. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that because, like I said, I learned that if I go into more detail, it gets, it gets uh, so complicated and beautiful that we'll run right over. Um, I see somehow, yeah, we, uh, uh, you know what? Uh, we lost one of the figures. Uh, uh, Francois, we lost one of the figures because here is supposed to be. Oh no! Ah, okay, fine, fine, sorry. Just my the rendering of it over there was wrong. Everything's cool. All right, so um, I guess I yeah. There's just a little bit more I want to say, and then I'll give sort of a survey of this first JCB paper. Um, there are two two structures that we're going to be considering subsequently. Um, one of them is called the RBD, the receptor binding domain. This lies on this viral glycoprotein, or in coronavirus case, on the, uh, on the spike uh, glycoprotein, so receptor, receptor binding domain. And that is the part of the spike that recognizes it, grabs on, to the host cell, recognizes and grabs onto the host cell, um, host cell receptor. And the other, the other structure in the viral glycoprotein that we want to study, that we shall be studying, is the so-called FP or fusion peptide. Because remember, I mentioned that uh, the viral particle, uh, either some, for many viruses, for some viruses, comes in through the through the membrane of the cell, or for the two guys we're studying here, uh, has to fuse this lipid bilayer with uh, the, 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 
boundary of the of, of the endosome. So it's got to somehow puncture and, and get its way, get out into the into the cytoplasm, either directly or through this endosomal particle. Um, okay, so there's the RBD and the fusion peptide. So uh, here's what I did in this first paper in the Journal of Computational Biology. Um, I took uh, five well understood uh, viruses and looked at their viral glycoproteins. Namely, influenza is perhaps the best study of all, of all uh, enveloped viruses. By the way, I guess I should have said, not all viruses are, have this lipid bilayer. Those are the enveloped ones. They're also non-enveloped or, or so-called naked ones. Um, and their attachment and fusion is not really so well understood, except maybe in a couple of cases. But anyway, uh, back to the JCB1 paper. Um, I took influenza's uh, viral glycoprotein. Actually, again, there are two. Uh, hemagglutinin is the one that I mentioned before uh, that carries both the RBD and the fusion peptide. Uh, another virus, uh, para, uh, paramyxovirus 5, and uh, uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus, and another virus called uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. I took these four uh, because those are the ones featured in the paper that I mentioned on fusion peptides, and because they give representatives uh, of, of the four, of, there are three classes of, of fusion, three classes of fusion mechanisms, and these four gave representatives of all three classes. Um, so I took these uh, viral glycoproteins before and after fusion, and uh, this is in sequence alignment because it's actually the same molecule. I align them molecule. I align them atom for atom, and then I uh, analyze what happened in the in the case of exotic. We have this notion of exotic residues where the free energy is in the if the neighboring guys is in the, uh, the the 90th percentile, and in those four cases uh, with, stati with statistical significance, I proved. Uh, the following, that exotic uh, implies that uh, at least one, either uh, of the two conformational angles, remember I said I, one of the two conformational angles changes by at least 180 degrees. Exotic implies either phi or psi changes, changes by at least 180 degrees. So in other words, Exotic implies conformationally active. And uh, this is kind of, here's, how, uh, here's maybe how you, is a, is a reasonable way to think of it. Um, there, the, the, this viral glycoprotein is like a little machine. And with the right stimulus, it, it wildly reconforms. I'll show you an example in a second for, for coronavirus. Uh, dramatically and wildly reconforms. The trigger for this might be the binding. Uh, it might be this, this uh, endocytic pathway is actually acidifying. So some viruses use the, 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 the acidity, the lower pH to, uh, to provoke the viral glycoprotein to, to reconform. But anyway, the, it reconforms dramatically. I think the, 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 the term tectonic changes is often used in the literature. So um, these tectonic changes come about because there are various chemical springs like, like uh, disulfide bonds that want to form. And you hold those in check with these high free energy hydrogen bonds so that you blow on it, and that's all it takes to break uh, the hydrogen bonds, remember, are at, are at minus one point, at best, at one minus 1.5 kilocalories per mole. Will bust them, and the high free energy ones are just itching to break. And they're like latches on a gate, like this gate with all these springs on it. And there are these latches that they break, and suddenly the, the molecule can reconform as it needs to for its function. And that's, uh, that's what is at play here that the exotic guys control. They target the high, they, they target the conformational change. The converse is not true. They're conforming, which and it makes perfect sense. If you have a, a hinge, uh, the, the, there will be big conformational changes at the hinge, but there's no free energy stored there. The free energy is on the latch, keeping the hinge from moving. So this makes perfect sense that the, the converse doesn't hold. 
Um, so I proved that there really is a, a perfectly good statistical proof, statistically legitimate argument that exotic implies conformational change. And there was one more thing I wanted to, to say. Um, and, I, and many other examples show that the, so, so I, I did these four examples in detail, and then I went and looked at, uh, at this, all PDB and all the virus, all the viral backup proteins I could find, uh, I forget, in the 50s or 70s or some huge number of, of, of viruses, um, and made a table, made a table of the high, the high free energy residues as targets for antiviral, and then we're back to the title, targets for antiviral uh, vaccines and drugs. Because, and and what, what I found in this table uh, is that the RBD, RBDs and the uh, FPs, these fusion peptides and RBDs, uh, often, I'm going to even say, you know, all, always is a tough word in biology because there ain't no such thing, but always, biologically, always. Uh, are exotic. Oh. Are exotic. Okay, so this is this, and these are the two takeaways. No, I guess not. They're, they're, we're, we're now done with the first part of biology, and now we'll move to this. this was the, the first uh, general computational biology paper, and we can go to our takeaway page, which is here because I do want to say one more thing. So it's like I said, uh, first of all, come on. Exotic implies conformationally active. And I'm sorry, I misspoke. I misspoke before. It's not that if it's exotic, that residues phi and psi change by at least 180 degrees, but within one, maybe one along the back, was sort of an error of one along the back. So it's nearby. So exotic implies nearby confirmation. Well, I'm sorry, I just misspoke before. I forgot to say that. It's not the residue on the nose, but it's maybe the next residue. It kind of makes sense if you, if you think about it. Uh, so that's the first takeaway, biological takeaway. Uh, the second one is that exotic residues Exotic residues uh, residues uh, should be, and that's the best I can say, should be, should be good antiviral targets for two reasons. One I already mentioned, antiviral targets. Uh, for two reasons. One I mentioned in the next I didn't yet. Uh, first of all, because uh, their interruption, for instance, attaching a, an antibody to them, uh, should, again, this word should, uh, block infection vis-a-vis -vis the, the fusion peptide and the RBT uh, in being incapacitated and the virus can't, can't uh, enter the cell. But there's another, there's another reason. And in fact, this actually was the first, the very first thing on the table was exotic residues are rare. Remember, that was the whole, the whole point is that they, they're, they're not very common in this density on on SO3. Well, if they're rare in the universe of all proteins, then probably they're rare in the host organism. And if they're rare in the host organism, the drug or vaccine that you're developing won't have side effects. So this is another, this is all just should, wish, hopeful, should, you know, modal, which should, could. Exotic are rare, so unlikely, so should, again, that's the best I can say this. So should, not have side effects. Okay, so here are two reasons for thinking these sites might be useful. There's going to be another well, one. In the yeah. Uh, there is a question by Alessandra Carbone. I'm going okay, to... Alessandra, hi. You have the mic, Alessandra. Do you hear me? 
Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi. So I had two questions indeed. So I found interesting the talk and um, this notion of exotic residues is indeed uh, interesting and um, I wonder whether uh, you checked this uh, role, special role of exotic residues uh, in viruses uh, where you know actually that there is a conformational change of, uh, for instance, the, the surface protein that might play a role indeed in fusion and there are viruses like uh, hepatitis c where you can see this and this type of conformational changes so it would be nice uh, eventually if you didn't do it maybe to to try to check the theory over them but uh, if you did maybe you can say some words about that no oh, indeed i did i'm sorry if i wasn't clear in the, in the jcb1 paper for influenza paramyxovirus 5 Yes. Uh, tick-borne encephalitis and vesicular stomatitis. That's precisely what I did. And in fact, what I didn't say there is, for example, with influenza, hemagglutinin, we really know what happens quite specifically in the hemagglutinin. And it was, there's a narrative discussion in the paper. It's stunning how the exotic residues, every single exotic residue is explained by function and every function is explained by the exotic residues. I, I did, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. I did okay. do exactly that quite carefully with these four examples. And so, thank you. And the, the second hep C, question... Hep C, and Hep C is a little more complicated. We don't really... Uh, hep C is not so well understood as the others, which is why I looked at the others first. Uh, there is a paper in 2018 on uh, hepatitis C speaking about, indeed, uh, this change of conformation. Uh, yeah, but, but it's, anyway, it's, controver it's controversial. Influence the, oh, it's the, four, exa the four examples I chose are not, not are not controversial. Not not uh, uh, not even uh, hepatitis C is controversial anyway. So, um, but yeah, okay, uh, I okay. pass to my second question, maybe, okay. and uh, which is uh, about uh, the evolution and coevolution of uh, uh, residues. And I would like to know whether uh, you. Uh you studied the relation between your exotic residues and this type of properties that you can study. I did not, and that's a very interesting suggestion. The coevolution is a very interesting suggestion. I haven't looked at that yet at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. It's a good, yeah, that, that's, that's a valuable, valuable, valuable suggestion. Thank you for your questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Carry on. Get on. Yep. Okay, um, I'm going to turn now to the JCB2 paper, and let me start though with a, a, a graphic, one I thought I lost. So just to give you a sense of the huge reconfirmation that takes place in viral glycoproteins, here I'm looking at the, on the left is the spike glycoprotein of uh, corona, uh, COV-2, SARS-CoV-2, namely the, the virus that causes uh, COVID. And a little explanation is in order. Um, there is this stalk-like region, and then on the top there are these three heads, and the heads go up and down. Uh, in the down, uh, so they go up and down. Here, this is a depiction where two of the heads are down, and the one on the far left, the head is up. Oh, sorry, this is what's called the cartoon version of a rendering of a protein where the alpha helices are given by these, in this case, pink uh, helices, these, these pink coils. Uh, the beta strands are given by yellow uh, fat arrows, uh, ribbon arrows, and uh, the loops, or the, the, other, the other part of the, the backbone, or the other part of the residues, are given by, uh, by this, the white, so the loops are given in white. <coughs> so on the left, as I was saying, you see the, the spike glycoprotein for, for SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID um, with one of the heads up. These heads independently go up and down. The interesting thing is when they're up uh, is the, 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 the RBD, the receptor binding domain, uh, the receptor is known to be ACE2 and it's only when the head is up that they can bind to ACE2. Uh, so there are these three heads, and when they're down, it can't bind, and when they're up, it can bind, the edge of it can bind to the ACE2. Moreover, you should know this is typical behavior for, for coronaviruses, and uh, in particular, uh, SARS-CoV-1, uh, the, the SARS infection from 2003, and MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, 
those being the three high morbidity coronaviruses, the neutralizing antibody is also on the edge of the head and, and, and presumably locks it in the up position and keeps it from, from binding. The fusion peptide, the FP, is down uh, at the very center. Uh, it's like, I don't know if you can see, I probably not, the audience here can see, is down at the center of where the three heads are. So when the heads are down, um, the, the fusion peptide is, is shielded from the immune system, as, are the, as is the RBD. And this is consistent with all examples I know. It's as if the immune system can smell exotic, and therefore the RBD and the FP, which are typically exotic, have to be hidden. And so when the heads are down for COVID, or for SARS-CoV-2, uh, both, both the RBD and FP are hidden. And when they're up, it's vulnerable. So uh, that's the left-hand picture. The right-hand picture is, the, so this was pre-fusion, and the right-hand picture is post-fusion. It's not corona, it's not, uh, it's not uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the, the PDB file we have there is for uh, another coronavirus, murine hepatitis virus, so a mouse coronavirus, but the behavior is expected to be the, essentially the same. And what happens is, upon binding, the, the spike lipoprotein has two domains, an S1 and an S2. The S1 is the head and the binding part, and it's cleaved away. And then uh, the S2, which contains the fusion peptide, if you remember, it's the fusion peptide is right in the middle between the three heads. It's like these, these, these bent uh, alpha helices straighten out, and the fusion peptide is now up here. It's a weapon ready to stab, ready to. To, to stab its way through the, in this case, the endosome. Um, but you see the, the level of reconfirmation is, is dramatic from, from the left-hand picture to the right-hand picture. And this is what uh, we're going to try and, and uh, block with in, in, in viral, viral uh, antiviral targets. Okay, so, um, I already mentioned the three human coronaviruses that have high morbidity, SARS, MERS, and COVID, those are the, the, the viral diseases. There are also uh, five endemic coronaviruses with not particularly interesting names, OC43, 229E, NL63, HKU1, and 4408. Uh, probably everyone in the audience fully 20% of the colds, human colds, are caused by these guys. So surely everyone in the audience has had one of these. They're not serious and, and one recovers. In fact, all of the endemic ones, except 4408, are represented in the PDB. And so in this, this GCB2 paper, I, there are about 45, something like that, uh, representatives of spike glycoprotein, of the coronavirus, human coronavirus spike glycoproteins in the PDB, 45, in various configurations of up, down, and, and at different pHs and things like that. So for each of these uh, three plus four, because remember one of them isn't represented in the PDB, for each of them that's represented, for each of these seven human coronavirus spikes, um, I chose a representative that was comparable. The heads were all down, and, uh, and I did the following. So there's the notion of a bifurcated hydrogen bond. Let me, we're short on time, let me not describe it. It's just what you think. It's where the uh, uh, receptor gets to share two, two uh, hydrogen, gets to share with two other hydrogens. And that's a so-called bifurcated hydrogen bond. And they occur, but they're kind of rare. Um, so I looked at bifurcated hydrogen bonds where at least one of the two hydrogen bonds had the maximum free energy. It's 9.85, it's 100th percentile. So it was kind of exotic square. It was as, as exotic as could be. And I looked at these, uh, these seven examples for bifurcated hydrogen bonds. And then I was just looking at the chosen representatives where I now find the sequence alignment. I, 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 I took sequence alignment for the, the primary structure of these glycoproteins, uh, these spike glycoproteins. And then I looked nearby for other bifurcated bonds or other anomalies of free energy. Here's the point. There's actually kind of a, a subtle, interesting new point here is that 
sequence alignment does not really correspond to structural or functional alignment of proteins. But the belief is nearly so. So in other words, though uh, these two align as words, the structure represented here might be over here, but nearby, not so far. Um, so I refined the sequence alignment by the free energy and hydrogen bond alignment. This is a general technique. This is a, a, sort of a new tool to refine sequence alignment into a structural alignment. Anyway, I, using this, I then looked for uh, things that were for, for, like I say, bifurcated bonds or anom nearby anomalies that were universal for all of these seven examples. And in fact, there were five such. Uh, then I checked moreover that these five such, remember I, I found them with just chosen representatives, but I made sure they persisted over all 45 uh, PDB files of, for, for spike like proteins. And they nearly did. They certainly, there was a compelling argument that they, that they did. And here they are. In a table. So remember there's SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1 mares, the ones with high morbidity, and here are the four of the five uh, endemic ones on the, on the lower lines, the four that are represented in the, in the PDB, and listed are the triples of residues. Why are they triples? Well, because it's a bifurcated bond. So you have this residue and also the other two, the, 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 the other two residues on the other side of the, of the hydrogen bond. Um, so uh, here in this table are listed these uh, aligned sites. Uh, there's something called accessible surface area that I think I won't go into. It tells you, which is, which is given in this table, it tells you how exposed are the, is, the, uh, is the residue. And I put in boldface the residues that were well exposed. Um, and I maybe should even have included site three. It was sort of a judgment call what is relatively more or less exposed. But the point here, what's the point here? The point here is that we can generate, we can build a vaccine that tar or a drug that targets the, maybe we can, if we're lucky, we can build a vaccine or a drug that targets the strain of coronavirus that we're dealing with today. And then a year and a half from now, when it's, when it's, when it's deployed, the, these, these RNA viruses have high, have high mutation rates. Um, and there's no guarantee that, the, that the, the variant, the vaccine we try and develop now will be of any utility in the, in the mutated version a year and a half from now. And the idea here was to find sites that were universal for all the human coronaviruses with the belief that uh, they will then be invariant under whatever mutations we're going to be dealing with uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2. So, first of all, let me show you, here's a picture, let me convince you that, oh, sorry, I guess I should say, yeah, I think I said this. There, there so are five I, sites. Yes? Just to tell you, uh, it's half past, so you may have 10, 15 minutes, but I just wanted to let you know. I have two more minutes. You know, I'll be finished in two more minutes, or we're very close to finishing. Um, thank you, thanks, Katrina. Um, I was saying, yeah, there, there are five of these sites that are universal for all the human uh, coronavirus diseases. And uh, for corona, for SARS-CoV-2, three of them are especially uh, accessible and visible. And here are those, here are those three, uh, maybe it's not so, the, the, this is the region just below the head. Uh, there, are these, there are these three heads that I mentioned, and adjacent to each head is also another little lobe. And uh, the, one, the, the sites A and B are in the lobe, and the site in, in figure C is down below. Figure D shows all three of them. So here are sites of, it seems to me, prime utility, or prime or should be useful, in, in drug or vaccine design for coronas, uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2. Because not only do they have the two attributes that I mentioned before, that there, there should be few side effects and they should interfere because they're high free energy, they should interfere with the function, um, but also now they're universal and should be robust under mutation. Um, 
<clears throat> I guess just a cut two more things. Uh, um, this is a little bit misleading because uh, corona, coronavirus spikes are highly glycosylated. They're covered with sugar. So it looks more accessible maybe than it is because these regions may be shielded with sugars. And not only that, in general, there is a kind of a three molecule layer of water around this is for any, any virus. So things are not quite as accessible as this picture makes them appear, as this, as this diagram makes them appear. Um, let me just say, there are many other applications for this tool. First of all, any other virus. Uh, in fact, I, I, my next goal is to, is to maybe try and look at dengue and the four serotypes and see if I can find something universal there, as we did here. At any rate, uh, there are many other, many other places in biology where the proteins we can form and, and, and knowing in advance where they do could be useful or, or uh, significant. For example, for example uh, in single transduction pathways, uh, tyrosine kinase receptors are well known to undergo dramatic uh, reconfirmation uh, for prions and amyloids, so for the disease of scrappy and, and Alzheimer's, uh, this, this should have applications. Also for motility proteins, by their very nature, reconform. Um, so for neural crest migration and melanoma uh, metastasis. So let me close finally with the two more, take, two more biological takeaways. Uh, one is, there's a third reason that I already alluded to that uh, these residues should be good antiviral targets, and that is they should uh, be robust under mutation. That was the whole point of the KCB2 being robust under the inevitable mutation. Um, and I guess the other thing I wanted to say is, I mean, more generally, uh, BHBs and free energy. Energy uh, should be again all these shoulds, all these models should be a useful tool going forward. Useful tool in general in structural biology. In structural biology. So I guess just the final sentence is. Never mind any of this. The next thing to do is to go into a wet lab and just take all this as phenomenological and take these sites for, for SARS-CoV-2 and see if they have the, the desired and required properties. Um, and that's something I'm trying to do is find wet lab collaborators to, uh, to participate in that. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. Any other questions? So, we do have questions. So we'll first give the mic to Aurora Clark. Uh, okay. Hi. Um, so that was really lovely, and I, I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank <laughs> um, you. Thank you. I, I, uh, I do have a question because, you know, there's a, and this is just a big picture kind of question in the sense that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with hydrogen atom positions, both from the PDB and, and you know, this is one of the reasons why people do uh, a lot of atomistic molecular simulations of proteins, right, to try and refine those hydrogen atom positions. Sure. And so I'm wondering, um, have you done like sensitivity analyses to try and understand how sensitive yeah, well, we're going to go back, go back to the construction of the, of the, uh, the positively oriented orthonormal three frame. It didn't use the hydrogen. It just used the backbone and the adjacent, uh, oxygen. I, I, I understand what you say is the location of the hydrogen atoms themselves is quite problematic. How, and they just have to be inferred. We can't see them, but I don't use them. Yeah. I don't use them. Oh, okay. I, 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 I see. Yeah, you're right. I understand exactly now what you mean. That's really interesting. Okay. And so then, so then I have another quick question maybe, and this has to do sure. with the, the quasi Boltzmann statistics that you use in the free energy. Yes. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not familiar with the quasi Boltzmann representation. I'm, I, I think I understand why you used it. Um, yes. But you know, like, 
if, if you used Boltzmann statistics and yes. um, and you took more of a, a statistical mechanics approach and you would say that you would construct a partition function over all kind of populated states associated with the with the system. Yes. Um, and so 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 what is the uh, from a practical perspective the the change in the population of of states as a result of yes, see, using it's just the it's different. I, no, I, I tried to allude to that. This is not a population of states. It's not Boltzmann statistics. It's not as yes. if it's not as if the 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 residues are jumping around. They're not. They're to, to achieve uh, stabilizing a particular protein detail. It is rather an, an analog. It's a, it's an analogy, uh, and the proof. You know, it's a real live mathematical proof. Right? Finkelstein. It's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful and substantial argument, um, but it's different. It's not, it's not Boltzmann statistics. It's not something so visiting you, states. You can't make an equivalence between the two? No, they're really, it's really just different. Okay. It has okay. to do with the statistics. It's as I said, to the extent that I understand, it has to do with the number of words, the number of primary structures that stabilize the protein detail you're looking at. It is not as if anything is jumping anywhere. You know, the, the, the primary structure of the protein is the primary structure of the protein. That's all you got, it's not changing. So it's really sort of different. This is, you know something, this is explained well in Finkelstein's book. The, the okay. very first reference that I gave, it's explained quite well. Okay, I will go there. Thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. So now we have a question by Eleni Panagiotou. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Sure. Um, I, I'm not very uh, familiar with um, uh, the, bone, the backbone hydrogen bonding. Uh, yes. So I wonder how many, if you know um, whether these are local or sequence distant. Uh, both. Hydrogen bonds occur both locally along the backbone and also long range. The, for example, the, the alpha helices are, are nearby along the backbone and there are various turns and so on. However, the, the, uh, the hydrogen bonds involved in beta strands can be quite far along the backbone, can even involve different chains, different protein chains, different proteins. Um, so bo both, both, both occur. Both short range and long range, if I understand your question. Yes, yes. And so is there um, anything noticeable different about the, them in the, in the um, exotic uh, ones? Are they in one family or the other? Um, and the answer there is n no. Um, uh, look, you have these uh these now let's go back to the clusters you have these clusters and at the at the mode of the cluster things are very dense so it's not so exotic unless of course the cluster has only very few members but in a large cluster like those for the common long-range bonds or alpha helices for example <clears throat> uh, near the mode it's not exotic however even in that cluster, so in something that you would regard as qualitatively similar, uh, far away are there could be very low density and it's high and something very exotic. So there's no um, particular, you know, I think <clears throat> the, the, <clears throat> the answer to your question here comes from the graphic that I put up of the flanking primary structures in the exotic tail is that somehow the answer resides there, is that there are these motifs of primary structure that themselves confer high free energy. And that has yet to be understood. Like I say, there's a machine learning problem there of it that uh, seems like an interesting thing to pursue. Well, thank you. So uh, I would have a question. Sure. Um, so the size that you mentioned at some point that for some well-known viruses, one can these um, exotic residues you can link them to some function of the yes. corresponding proteins. Yes. So for the size that you've uh, that you've isolated in the coronaviruses, um, somehow what 
should one do, I mean, how, it's a bit naive, what can one do to try to link each of those sites with a function or... Okay, we, listen, I mean, uh, cor the, I, sh I should have said this and I didn't get time. Uh, we have no idea the actual mechanics. Remember that I had this picture of, a, of pre and post fusion coronavirus, coronavirus spike. Uh, we have no idea how we get from one to the other. The mechanics is absolutely not known. Uh, it, it took decades to understand influenza by, by doing point mutations and so on. Um, we have no clue how to get from one to the other. But what these, these free energy techniques suggest is however you're getting from here to there, this site matters. And that's why these, these are suggested as, as antiviral targets. So just to emphasize, we have no clue how the coronavirus spike reconforms pre and post fusion. I mean, it's like a complete mis these tectonic changes are completely unknown. And indeed, that's the case, I would say, for almost all viruses. It's a handful of them where decades of, of study have uncovered the mechanics. Influenza, the, the four that I mentioned, are, are, are presumably well understood from you know, all this uh, heavy analysis. Polio is also partly understood. That's a, that's a naked, naked virus, but it's a handful of them that we, we really understand the mechanics a priori. And that's kind of, like I said, that's kind of the point, is now never mind that incredibly complicated and time-consuming question. Whatever is the mechanics, here are some sites that probably are involved. And again, I go back to this model that should be involved. Okay, so it's some kind of blind testing that's... We don't uh, know. We have no idea. may actually work. We have, like I said, I, I, I mean, I can now sort of throw my hands up and say, I'm a biologist. Now we got these sites. Let's go do the biological experiments. Never mind where they came from. Um, but, but the specific, again, just to emphasize, the specific mechanics of viral glycoprotein reconfirmation, we know a handful of examples, and that's all. Okay, thanks. Sure. I mean, I got, apparently we know hep C better than I. Apparently, there's a 2018 paper that Carboni mentioned that I, I should go study for, for hep C that there's more known there than I'm aware. So I don't see any more questions in the chat. Should we see if the locals have questions? You guys have any questions? Or you're just tired as I am probably. Just, just, a, question. just a quick question. So, so you, you found these rare uh, the exotic places are uh, in the core of this uh, of the spike, but it's still folded up. Yes. Um, but don't you expect also to find special things in the hinges of these spikes when they flip out and do things? I don't expect, I sort of alluded to that, I don't really expect free energy there. The free, you imagine, imagine that uh, there's a spring like like a, like a cysteine, oh, you're trying to, form, trying to form a, a disulfide bond that wants it to be like that. So good. here's here's the hinge, and the and, and the high free energy isn't the cysteine, it isn't the hinge, it's the pin holding the the hinge. Like I said, it's like the latch on a gate is the way I've come to think of it. So the hinges aren't necessarily. A, and, 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 and indeed, hold on. Remember, the implication is just one way. Exotic implies conformationally active not conversely. So there are all these other conformationally active places like hinges that you don't expect to anticipate free energy. So you, can you find interesting places by comparing sort of the, uh, the pre and post uh, conflict for creation of your proteins there? That's exactly what I did in these four examples. But this precious few that we even have, we have a pre and post fusion. Uh, Period. I mean, I, I sort of did what I could in the four, okay. four well-known examples. There are probably a couple more I could have done. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anyway, thank you all for your attention.